Hey everybody, it's meteorologist Brad Panovich here. A beautiful day across the Carolinas. It has just been an amazing stretch of weather here the last couple of days. And today's topic is really timely because I talked a lot about this on Monday with our severe weather. And today's topic is the jet stream. Now we talked about several types of jet streams, but I wanted to break down the basics of what the jet stream is, kind of how it forms, how it got its name, and more importantly, show you a demonstration of why the jet stream is really, really important to severe weather and why sometimes when we see strong mid and low level jet streams like we saw on Monday, we tend to get some severe weather. So let's get right into it and start talking about jet streams. So today's topic, we gotta start with the Earth. The Earth is a sphere, it's a globe, it's a circle, right? Most of us know it's shaped somewhat like a ball. Now, the Earth rotates on its axis once every day, every 24 hours, it rotates on that axis. That axis is a slightly tilted at 23 and a half degrees. But because of a, a force called the Coriolis effect, which is the effect of the Earth rotating, it causes people or movement at the equator to be faster. I mean, if you think about it, near the poles, you're actually rotating much slower than you are down at the, at the equator because it takes a long time for the equator to rotate once around the entire globe. So if you were standing on this point on our map here, you can see right here, you would take, you would be moving at 138 miles per hour. Here in the Northern Hemisphere, about halfway up, you're moving about 733 miles per hour. And then at the globe, you're barely moving at all because you're kind of sitting in one spot as the earth is rotating. Now that Coriolis effect is really important to how the atmosphere kind of sets up. Because of that, we tend to get these currents that form. And I'm gonna zoom in on this. We call these cells. There's a polar cell, there's the femoral cell, and there's the Hadley cell. These form between the equator and the North Pole because of this rotation around Earth. Now, in between these cells, we get jet streams. The jet streams have two specific types that we talk about, and you'll hear this a lot in the winter, is the polar jet stream. It's kind of what we refer to as the polar front. It keeps the cold air separated from the mid-latitude and tropical air. The polar jet is a huge factor in severe weather, but also in winter weather. So everybody who loves to get some snow, that's a very important part of whether we get snow or not. And here's a better view of it, and I'll zoom in so you can see it. But you can see how these are oriented between the equator and then up to the polar region. So the polar jet separates the polar air from the temperate air, and the subtropical jet stream separates the temperate air from the tropical air. Those two jet streams, when they work together, we tend to get big, big storms like we do in the winter. We call that phasing when the jet streams kind of come together, and that's what causes the jet streams to come together. But you gotta understand where the jet streams are occurring in the atmosphere. So we'll look at the, the atmosphere. Here's the atmosphere kind of split in half. And if you go from the bottom to the top, the troposphere is the lowest part of the atmosphere. That's actually where all of the weather occurs. So I'm actually gonna grab my telestrator here, so bear with me. And if you thought this wasn't live, this will give you a good example of why it is live. So I'm gonna grab my telestrator here and we'll see down here is the troposphere. This is where we live the lowest parts of the atmosphere. Jets fly at about 30,000 feet, which is about five to 10 miles up, depending on what kind of plane it is. The jet stream, because it occurs in this layer of the atmosphere where jets fly, we call it the jet stream. It's just a fast moving current of air, kind of like the main current in a river. And that's the best way I can explain it to you is that the jet stream is like a river of air in the atmosphere, away from it, there are lighter winds and in the middle of it, there are stronger winds. And just to show you an indication of just how strong those winds could be, we do a little cross section of where this would be in the atmosphere. And I'll show you, if the jet stream was above our heads, it would look like this in three dimensions. Right in the middle of it is the fastest currents, right there in the middle. And on the outsides are the slower currents. And right there, the core of the jet stream is where the strongest winds occur. And here's a kind of a 3D model of it to kind of show you um, in miles per hour what the jet stream looks like. So it kind of looks like a giant tube and the winds get stronger in the middle. That middle part or the core of the jet stream, sometimes where we have really fast currents, we call it a jet streak where the jet stream winds are super, super fast within that little cell. And that's where we get some of the strongest winds. 
how do they orient around the globe? Well, here's a good map. This will kind of show you. I'm going to zoom in a little bit on it so you can see it. You can see where the polar jet stream is. It basically wiggles between the polar regions and down to the south. Here's a subtropical jet stream. And then near the equator, there's almost no jet stream at all. There's very light winds down near the equator. What happens is the jet streams will work together. Sometimes the polar jet will phase with the southern branch and we'll get big storm systems develop. But during the seasons, the polar jet stream retreats all the way back up to the polar regions and the subtropical jet stream starts moving north as well. So if you ever wonder about why the winter pattern never really correlates with the summer pattern, it's because the jet streams kind of go to Canada for the summer. And we rarely see the jet streams once we get into the summer months. And I'll show you why. Here's a great map that kind of illustrates the position of the polar jet stream um, during the summer versus during the winter. So I'll widen this out a little bit so it's nice and big and you can see it. So during the winter, the polar jet stream will do all this. It'll go all over the place. When we get a ridge, it's warm. When we get a dip, it gets cold air. But during the summer months, you know what happens? The polar jet goes way up here and we never see it. That's why we don't get cold fronts very often during the summer. So what happens down here, the subtropical jet stream will buckle way up to the north and will be ridges of high pressure, which will keep us super hot and super dry. And we end up getting more weather coming in from the Atlantic or the Gulf of Mexico. So during the winter time, our weather comes from the Northwest and the West, but during the summertime, oftentimes our weather comes from the South. It flips direction completely. And because the polar jet stream goes up in here, we tend not to get many storm systems. So our average rainfall during the summer is all driven by pop-up thunderstorms. It's not really driven by you know, cold fronts and warm fronts. But this time of year, April, where we are now, is the worst time of year for severe weather because both jet streams, the subtropical and the polar jet stream, kind of work together this time of year and it creates big time storms. So I wanted to show you um, what this looks like. This is a real time view of the current upper level jet stream. And you can see there is a lot of jet stream wind. Look at all that wind over North America right now. The winds are flying from west to east. So we have a very strong jet stream over us. In fact, you can see, whoops, you can see it kind of buckling here uh, back and forth across of North America. So let me grab my telestrator again. I got to reactivate it. For some reason, it went off the thing. So we'll re-grab it here. And you can see the jet stream is buckling up here and then coming down here. But look how strong the winds are across North America. Just howling. Now, this is the upper level jet. There's actually several other kinds of jet streams in the lower part of the atmosphere, and we can drop down to those levels. So I'm going to drop down to the mid-level jet. Now, this is around 10 to 15,000 feet. You can see the jet stream here is really strong as well, but not as strong as the upper level jet, where the strongest winds on Earth usually occur. You can see it's pretty much west to east. So I'll zoom in real close. So we would refer to this as zonal flow. Everything's moving west to east. When we get ridges like we see to our south, you can see a pretty big one right there, um, right over the Gulf of Mexico. That's a ridge of high pressure. This is a trough. So these are mountains and valleys in the atmosphere. And that's why sometimes you, re you hear us refer to them as troughs and ridges. Let's go down even further to the lowest levels. Let's go down to a low level jet around 700 millibars. And we're going to go down to 850 millibars, which is what we consider the low level jet. The low level jet is around 5,000 feet. Now, it's usually much weaker. When we see strong low level jets like we saw on Monday, we tend to get severe weather. And if you look carefully, there's a pretty good low level jet developing into the storm system over the Great Lakes right now. Right in that area, we've got some pretty strong winds um, developing. But on Monday, these winds that were over us in the low levels were around 100 miles per hour, just at 5,000 feet. That was very, very strong winds. And so that sometimes can produce um, some damaging winds down at the surface. When we see that damaging winds down at the surface, that's when we get damage like straight line winds, tornadoes, and sometimes even severe weather. So I wanted to show you what that means. And I'm gonna show you a quick little video and demonstration of how the low level winds can have a big impact down here at the ground once we get mixing. Hey everybody, this is Chief Meteorologist Brad Panovich. Today's topic is jet streams. Jet streams are fast moving currents of air 
that actually happen at a couple different levels. The main jet stream happens way up at 25 or 30,000 feet, but there's other jet streams. You may have heard me refer to them as the mid-level jet and the low-level jet. So my son Kyler is going to represent a high-level jet. Up around 30,000 feet, the winds can be blowing anywhere from 80, 90, sometimes 200 miles per hour. The mid-level jet is more down in the 10 to 15 thousand foot range and it can blow sometimes 100 knots or more maybe 120 miles per hour but what happened last week and on monday this is what we had down at the lowest levels 5,000 feet above our head so go up a little bit we had a strong low level jet okay now down at the ground we've got our army guys and our boat this is going to represent you down at the ground how do those strong winds above our head end up getting down to the surface well what happens is thunderstorms form and these thunderstorms sometimes can be as tall as 30,000 feet so the top of the storm can get into the upper level jet the mid levels can be in the mid level jet and the low level jet can be down here so watch what happens when we have a strong low level jet at 5,000 feet it's going to be right here and a storm develops go ahead Kyle. you see what happened what happened was those winds were able to mix down to the surface. So oftentimes when we see these strong jet streams in the mid, upper, and lowest levels of the atmosphere, we get really concerned when we see thunderstorms develop because it can mix those winds down to the surface. And that's how we get damaging winds that blow down trees, power lines, and even damage homes. So yeah, that's a huge part of why we sometimes get those strong winds down at the surface. So when you hear us refer to low-level jets and mid-level jets, those normally aren't that big of a deal unless you're flying through them. But a case like Monday, when we get a strong low-level jet and you get storms or showers, it mixes or deflects those winds down to the surface. Now, you don't truly get the same speeds that you're seeing up at 5,000 feet, but even if you get a half or a third of those wind speeds, like on Monday, which were 100 miles per hour, we had sustained winds at some points between 30 and 40 and gust over 50 or 60. So that's how it developed. Now, this site is really cool. You can see the whole globe in one piece. I always like looking at this to just see how the atmosphere is flowing. If we go back up to 250 millibars, we can get a really good view of the jet stream pattern across the whole globe. And you can see near the equator here, there isn't much wind. Notice the jet stream is almost non-existent near the equator. But look how strong it is in the mid and upper levels of the atmosphere as you get into the mid latitudes and up towards the polar regions. And you can see all the kinks in the jet stream. One way to look at the jet stream, it's always going up and down. And if it has to buckle up somewhere, it means it's dipping somewhere else. You think about it like a hose, it's all connected. And if you buckle it in one location, you force it down. So what happens oftentimes is when we see big cold snaps over the Carolinas, I'm gonna move the globe here back to the United States. When we tend to see cold snaps like we are in right now, we had a frost the last two nights. Typically what's going on is there's a big buckle in the jet stream over Alaska, which is forced to dip in the jet stream over the Eastern US. And when we're having heat waves here, usually it's very cold over the Alaska area and a big ridge is developed over the Eastern US. So the jet stream is one of the most crucial things to understanding how the atmosphere works. If we know where the jet stream is, it typically will tell us where it's cold and warm, but also it is the typical storm track. Low pressure systems tend to move along the jet stream as it moves across the globe. So hope you had a little, a little taste of how jet streams work. They're really fascinating. They're really important to our weather. Sometimes we forget about them because they're way up there in the sky, around 30, 40,000 feet up there but jet streams are a fascinating thing to study. Now, in the comments, I'm gonna post some links to some of these websites if you wanna interact with the jet stream. These are really cool sites. This is a null school net net is a, is a really cool map. Windy.com uh, is another great site which shows the streamlines and you can look at the different levels of the atmosphere and also look out into the future using model data to kind of see where the jet stream is going to be. Today's topic, jet streams, one of my favorite things to talk about. Hope you enjoyed today's weather school. Remember, next week we'll be back on Monday through Friday every day at one o'clock. And if you miss any of these segments, you can go to WCNC.com. We've got them all listed right there. Thanks again for tuning in to Weather School for Friday. Now get outside and enjoy some of this beautiful weather because it is great. That's what I'm going to do with my kids right now. Have a great Friday.